computer industry. Uh, uh, there's a lot of cheating going on in every industry. And so if we take the material results, in other words, the money from that occupation, and we engage that money in some kind of direct service, then it becomes purified. That's the whole idea, for example, of offering prashada. Uh, just like when, when uh, we're working in the garden, we can't help it if we step on some bugs, or uh, we have to dig up some weeds. You know, those are living entities too. Well, we cause them pain and distress because we have to dig them up and throw them out in the sun and let them dry up uh, so that they won't take over our garden. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any produce from our garden. So, we have to understand that it's uh, unavoidable to cause pain to other living entities. It's unavoidable to, to uh, generate karma by one's livelihood. But we can purify that karma by offering the results to the Lord. So the beans that we pick from our garden uh, and other things, when we offer them, then all that karma from the distress that we have to cause other living entities is nullified by the Lord. Uh, he he dis destroys that karma and instead of uh, getting karmic reactions, we get love of Godhead because now those beings or whatever it is are in relationship with the Lord. They're not just material things anymore. They become sacraments. They become sacred. So we can do that with everything in life. Uh, for example, when I was working in the computer field and I was making money, then I was using that money to preach on the internet, to travel to India, to uh, go to different festivals and stuff like that. I used that money in the service of the Lord. And if I had been able to find a spiritual organization that wasn't corrupt, I certainly would have given donations to that organization organization. Huh? And so now, of course, any money that we get here, any donations that we get, are fully utilized in the Lord's service, because there's nothing that we're doing here that's material. That You have to learn that art of karma yoga. That's the solution to your question. Buddha has a question. Does Sankhya yoga belong to the mode of passion? Why would you say, which Sankhya Yoga, and why would you say that? Are you talking about atheistic Sankhya or Lord Kapila Dev Sankhya? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, what? Today's Sankhya. Today's Sankhya. Yeah. Well, the Sankhya of the, of the scientists and people like that, of course that's mode of passion. Because they're using discrimination to separate the different material elements and stuff like that. But the ultimate goal is material enjoyment. Uh, they don't care about analyzing the cause of the universe uh, to come to the absolute truth. They just want to know how they can determine the different material elements and so forth so that they can use it for some material process. So even, so even if they come to the proper conclusions, their motivation is wrong. Their intention is material. So that's not going to get them anywhere worth going. <laughs> That's just going to result in more bondage in the material world. Okay, Andres has a question. What is that? So there are many devotees that are being cheated at this time by the not realized gurus. But is in it that that what they want? Uh, is that what they want? I suppose you did mention. Well, it's what they want in the sense that they don't have the courage to go out and. Uh, separate themselves from that situation. You see? Um, when I was in ISKCON and then these new gurus took over, 
I already knew that they were phony because I knew the, the personalities involved and I also knew that Srila Prabhupada had given me some instructions uh, that this is going on and to get out of there. So I separated myself from ISKCON and became independent very early, uh, like 1979. But many devotees couldn't tear themselves away from ISKCON. So either they got kicked out because they asked too many questions, or um, they simply stayed in and, um, you know, became like whoop dogs, basically. Uh, I've seen these devotees, and they all have this kind of, you know, they're morose, they're depressed, their, their posture is, is, looks like they're defeated. Huh? It's because the high ideals that they joined the ISKCON movement to pursue are actually not found there. And so they're feeling defeated that they have not been able to attain what they actually set out to find. Uh, it's been taken away from them. They feel cheated. But yet, they feel that they can't leave ISKCON because the propaganda is, this is Srila Prabhupada's body and it's the only place that you can do real devotional service. So they're like caught between a rock and a hard place. You know? And they just don't have the courage, they don't have the, uh, uh, the guts to say, no, I'm not accepting this, this is wrong, and walk out the door. Uh, and yes, it's tough, it's difficult, because of the way that ISKCON demonizes people who leave. It's very difficult to maintain your friends, uh, your associates, or any connection with Krishna consciousness. In ISKCON, you're either in or you're out. And if you're out, then it's it's uh, like being totally on your own. There's no more connection. So this is a, a mechanism that cults use to keep people in uh, by making very, very sharp distinctions between who is in and who is out. And by demonizing the people who leave, uh, who had a, a problem or a question that they couldn't resolve. So, uh, yeah, the people who are being cheated, they know on some level that they're being cheated, but they just don't have the courage to resolve the situation by leaving. Okay, Peter asks, could you give an example of Prabhupada being really heavy on someone? Why? I don't know, because... Uh, it's Peter. That's... Thank you. <laughs> Connor says, that's Peter. <laughs> well, there are, there are plenty of examples in the various books about Srila Prabhupada. I don't need to go into that. No, he says, don't worry about my question. But he was heavy because they were heavy. He had, he had to be uh, so heavy with some of his leaders because they were such rascals that if he wasn't very strong with them, they would have ruined everything even faster than they did. So uh, he had to be he had to be very strong with them. And on the, it's interesting because I find with my students that I, I don't have to be like that at all. I mean, there's some people who come on the site. And you can tell they just don't get it at all, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe sometimes we're a little bit strong with them. Uh, but with the people who are sincere, with the people who are actually following, there's no need to be heavy. Prabhupada was never heavy with me. He never chastised me, not once. I mean, the closest he came to chastising me was one time I wrote him, and said, I want to learn Bengali so I can study Chaitanya Charitamrita in the original. And uh, actually, I don't think he knew that I had been one of the editors of Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, his, his books, uh, and that I was very, very interested in the subject. 
But anyway, he wrote back saying that it's not necessary to learn Bengali. We don't encourage people to learn new skills. Um, just take whatever skills you've got and engage them in Krishna's service. And then he uh, observed that I had written some very nice essays and that I should write. Uh, he said, just explain. He said, read our books and explain everything in your own words. And that way you'll become a very successful preacher. So he started out a little bit chastising, eh, you don't need to learn Bengali. But then he became very um, encouraging and said, you just write. And that's what I've been doing. <laughs> because of that instruction, I, later on I became a writer. And actually became a professional writer for more than 20 years. Earned my living that way. That was all due to Prabhupada's mercy. <laughs>